and today we are going to discuss the second part of our section of processing and presenting data in which we are going to discuss about the uh, different methods of data presentation in the form of figures and form of uh, graphs or charts. The graphical techniques are the most commonly used method of data presentation. And why the graphical techniques are most commonly used method? Because they are used to make the data more representative and to point out the trends and patterns in the observations. So uh, it is always helpful to display or to represent your data in the form of uh, graphs, in the form of charts, if it is possible. Why? Because uh, your data and your observations or your results, they, be, they will become more representative if they are presented in the form of a graph. And it will also be very uh, easy to point out the trends and patterns in your observations, that what are the trends in your observations and what are the patterns which can be uh, deduced from your observations. So the graphical techniques, they always make data more representative and they make data more meaningful to understand. So graphical techniques or making graphs or charts, it is the most commonly used method of data presentation in science. And there are different types of the graphs that you can use, but that depends on the type of the data that you have. So it's not that every kind of a graph is suitable for any kind of a data, no. There are different types of the graphs that, can, that are suited only in some specific types of the data for some spe specific types of the variables. So looking at your data, you have to choose that what type of graph you are going to use. So the choice of the graph is, again, the fundamental concept or it is the fundamental um, decision that you have to make in presenting your data. And all of your data presentation, it depends on the choice of the graph, the choice of the graphical technique, the choice of the chart that you are going to use to present your data. So this is particularly important that you are going to choose the graph according to the type of your data, according to the type of your observations. Now we are going to discuss some very basic types of the uh, graphs and we are starting from the dot diagram. Dot diagram, it gives a rough but rapid visualization of data and it consists of a horizontal line which is marked out with divisions on the scale. So here you can see that we have a horizontal line which is the solid line here and then you can see that it has been marked on a scale. So, there, it, so this line is divided into different units and it is according to a scale and you're just going to put a dot in place of your observation. So upon repetition of the observations, dot, dots are stacked on top of each other. So this is the most basic type of the graph, but this type of the graph is only for the rough visualization of your data, especially when you are in field research and you don't have access to your computer and you want to just see that what are the trends in your data, what are the trends in your observations. So you're just going to make a dot diagram and this dot diagram is not used as the final form of presentation. So this is more of your uh, work, uh, this is more of your rough work that you're going to use during taking your observations or deducing some initial results out of your observations. So this is not used as the final form of presentation. Now we are going to see that how we can use the dot diagram to see the trends in our data, to see the initial trends or patterns in our data. So we are taking the example of the length of leaves and we have 17 observations here. And let's start making the dot diagram for this data. So here we have the horizontal line and it has been marked with the scale. And you can see that the, the, this line is divided into a scale and the scale starts from the lowest observation, which is 60, and it goes up to 66, which is the highest observation in our data. So this has been divided one unit apart. Now, when we look at the data, our first observation is 60, right? So what we are going to do is we are going to place a dot over 60, right? So we are going to place a dot over here and we are going to mark out that this observation has been plotted. 
and then the next observation is 62 and we are going to put a dot in front of 62 on our dot diagram and we are going to mark this one then the next one is 64 and we are going to put a dot over here in front of 64 and we are going to mark this out and then the next one is 65 so we are going to place a dot over 65 and we are going to mark it here and then the next one is 66 and we are going to place the dot in against 66 we are going to mark this out then the next observation is 62 so let's see so there is already a dot in front of 62 so we are what we are going to do is we are going to stack the next dot over this one so here is the second dot so this is how we are going to uh, place the dots in front of all the observations that we can see from our data and we are going to get our final graph here so here you have uh, placed all the observations in the form of dots onto the diagram so this is the dot diagram that you have so what you can deduce from this dot diagram is there anything uh, visible for the trends right so you can see that your observations are scattered over 63 millimeters right so you can see the trends in this dot diagram quite easily and again because this is the figure so you have to describe what this figure is about although this dot diagram is not the final form of your presentation but still you are going to use it in your rough work so therefore you have to properly label your, this diagram and on the horizontal axis what you have you have the leaf length which is presented in millimeters uh, which has been measured in millimeters and it starts from 60 and it goes up to 66 so the horizontal scale or the horizontal axis or the x-axis of this graph shows the leaf length and what is the y-axis about y-axis is about frequency so here we can see that the observation number 60 on the x-axis has a frequency of one which means it is presented in the data only once and then the 61 has a frequency of two it means that in our observations we have two observations which are 61 which measure to 61 then is 62 and we can see that there are three observations which are measured as 62 in our whole data then we can see 63 and in 63 how many dots do we have we have five dots it means its frequency is five and then the 64 it has a frequency of 3, 65 has a frequency of 2, and 66 has a frequency of 1. So it gives us a, a quick visualization of our data with that what are the trends in our data. And we can see that our observations are scattered over 63 millimeters. So this is how you make a dot diagram for the rough visualization of your data. And you have to give, give the caption as well that this figure represents the frequency distribution of leaf length. So in the figure, you are going to uh, describe the variable which has been plotted in this graph. And also you are going to define that what attribute of the variable is being described here. So you are, uh, you are describing the variable which is leaf length and uh, how you are going to describe this variable. You are going to uh, give the frequency that how many times a specific measurement, a specific observation is repeated in your data. So this is how you make the dot diagram. Now we are going to take another example for the dot diagram, and this is about the number of orchids in 16 randomly placed quadrants. So in the previous example, we took an example of a variable which was measured on the measurement scale. And now we are going to take the observation of uh, a count variable, which is actually the count of things. So in this case, we have the number of orchids and they are, uh, the number of orchids have been counted from 16 randomly placed quadrants. And these are the observations of those 16 quadrants. So zero represents no orchid count in that quadrant, two represents two orchids in that quadrant and so on. So this is our data and let's see how we are going to make the dot diagram for this data. 
So here we have the dot diagram. And again, starting from the lowest observation, we have zero and going up to the highest observation, which is six. So you can see clearly from this data that there are seven quadrants that contain no orchids. So you get a quick result out of your data and you can easily see that what this data uh, is about and uh, what trends are visible in this data. So in this case also you have to properly label the dot diagram and you can see that we have given the caption which is frequency distribution of orchid counts. So in this case the variable is the number of orchids and what we are plotting on the y-axis is their frequency, right? So now we discuss another type of the graph, which is the line plot. And again, line plot is used for the rough visualization of your data on discrete variables, which are measured on a nominal scale. So this kind of the graph is usually used for representation of the uh, count data. And this is used for the description of the discrete variables which are measured on a nominal scale and it uses lines uh, which is that is bars to represent discrete categories of data example is you have 31 nest boxes placed in a wood and they are occupied by different bird species so we can see that there are four bird species and they have occupied these nest boxes so how many boxes um, do we have we have a total of 31 nest boxes, right? And we can see that they have been occupied by different species of birds. Now we want to make a figure or we want to make a plot of this diagram, of, the, of this data. So we have our observations here in which we have counted the frequencies and we are going to make this plot. And in this plot, again, you can see that we have labeled everything properly. The figure is frequency distribution of nest boxes occupied by different birds. And in this caption, you can see that we have defined which is drawn on the x-axis and which thing is drawn on the y-axis, right? So we have defined everything. Then on the, uh, we have also defined the axis. We have also labeled the axis. So on the x-axis, you can see that we have the names of the species because these are the nominal categories so we have names of different categories we have names of different classes and these are the names of different birds and then on the x y axis we have the frequency and which is the number of nest boxes which have been occupied by a specific species so we can see that the highest number of boxes have been occupied by the blue jet and the least number of boxes, which is two, has been occupied by nuthatch. So here we can have a rough visualization of our data. And again, this line plot is about the representation of nominal categories over a scale, right? So this is how we make the line plot. And line plot is also a, not a formal or the final form of presentation. So this is just for your own visualization. If you want to quickly look at what are the trends in your data, what are the trends in your observations, right? Now, after um, defining the two basic types of the graphs that you can use for your own work, for um, your own visualization of the data, now we come to the most commonly used uh, type of the graph that is used in the presentation of scientific observations and for the presentation of your data in your thesis, in your papers, and in your presentations. So histograms, they are the most commonly used type of the graph in scientific research. So in histograms, uh, we can represent frequencies in the form of blocks. And the histograms, they are particularly useful for continuous variables, but they are used for the count data as well. And we are going to take the example of count data first. So here we have the number of orchids in 16 randomly placed quadrants. So we have the number of orchids and the frequency of quadrants. And now we are going to make the histogram for this type of the data. And here we have our observations and which are the number of orchids and the frequency of the quadrants. Let's start by making the histogram. And here we have the histogram, the chart for the histogram. And in this one, you can see that we have the x-axis and the y-axis. So what is there on the x-axis? 
the x-axis represents the number of orchids and the y-axis represents the frequency of quadrants, right? And we have drawn scale over these axes as well. On, so the number of orchids, because they start from zero and go up to six, so we have scaled from zero to six on the x-axis. Then on the y-axis, our frequencies, the, the highest frequency is seven and the lowest frequency is one. So we have started from zero and we have taken up the scale up to eight. So the, the making of the scales, it is up to you that from where you want to start your histogram. So from in this data, we are starting our histogram from zero on both axes and we are taking up the observations up to six on the x-axis and up to eight on the y-axis. So this is the basic structure of the chart that we are going to use our, to make our histogram. And then you can see that we have the x-axis grid lines and we have the y-axis grid lines. Now, what are these grid lines for? So these grid lines are to help you locate your observation onto the chart to draw it. So uh, the grid lines, they are basically going to help you when you're going to make your graphs on uh, manually on the paper, right? So these grid lines, they're particularly helpful in making the graphs uh, on paper because in that way, you are going to easily scale out your observations onto the chart, that where on the chart your values should be placed. So this is kind of a scale that you have to draw your histogram. Now let's start by making the histogram. So here we have the first observation, which is zero number of orchids and the frequency of quadrants is seven. So on our chart, it has to be here, right? So zero is the value of the x-axis and seven is the value of the y-axis, which is the number of quadrants that have zero orchids in them. So this is our, our block and we are going to make a block in this one. So we have our first block on the histogram and this block corresponds to the number of orchids zero and the frequency of quadrants seven, right? So this block represents our first observation, which is zero number of orchids in seven quadrants. Then we are going to take our second observation, and this observation is the number of orchids one and the frequency of quadrants is three. So again, we are with the help of the grid lines, we are going to locate that where our values are. So we are going to draw one line up to three, on the scale or the unit of one on the x-axis and we are going to draw a line from uh, up to one on the x-axis. So here we have our next block which represents the number of orchids and the frequency of quadrants in our second observation. And this is one and three, which means there are three quadrants which have only one orchid in them. And then we are going to draw the next blocks as well. So this is how we make the histogram and the histogram blocks. You can see that these blocks, they represent the values on the x-axis and on the y-axis. So the first block represents the value on the x-axis as zero and on the y-axis as seven. The second block represents the value of one on the x-axis and three on the y-axis. Then we have the third block, which represents the value of two at the x-axis and two on the y-axis. And then we have the blocks three, four, uh, uh, the, the next four blocks that represent the value of three, four, five, and six respectively on the um, x-axis and the value of one on the y-axis, right? So this is how we are going to make the histogram for the count data. And by removing the grid lines, you can have your final histogram. And in the histogram, again, this has to be labeled. And you can see that we have labeled the x-axis and we have labeled the y-axis. And also we have given the caption, which is the frequency distribution of ORCID counts. And again, just like the frequency tables, their, uh, their labeling and their caption is particularly important that unless and until you have 
described the x-axis and the y-axis and unless and until you have described that what this chart is about you're not going to get the full credit so this is the histogram of account data now we are going to take the example of a continuous variable and this continuous variable is about the measurement of 150 dead fish and what this measurement is about this is measurement about the total length of these dead fish that are recovered from a stream following a pollution incident right so here you have the frequency table you have the class limits of the length of fish and you have the number of fish which represents their frequency so in the first class uh, you can see that the observations they fall from 100 to 109 millimeters of length and the number of fish that fall into this class are seven then we have the next class which is uh, 110 millimeters to 119 millimeters and we can see that there are 16 fish that fall into this class now we are going to see that how we can make the histogram for the this kind of the data so here you have the histogram for this data and in this histogram you can see that we have made the blocks and how we have made the blocks by scaling the length of fish on the x-axis and by scaling the frequency of fish along the y-axis so we start our scale from 100 because our observations start from 100 so we are just simply starting from 100 and then the the, the first block right so the first block represents our first observation which corresponds to 100 to 109 and the value of seven on the y-axis now here you can see that we have the uh, uh, the scale uh, which is continuous right so our first block starts from 100 and our next block is continuous to it and it starts from 110 then our third block is also continuous and it starts from 120 which is the lower limit of the neck of the third class so the, the, these blocks, why we said that these blocks uh, or histograms, they are particularly useful for the measurement variable, because here you can see that we have a continuity of observations. So our first block starts from 100 and our next block starts from 110. So our measurements are going to be continuous. So our first block is from 100 to 109 and our second block starts from 110 and it goes up to 119 then our third block starts from 120 and it goes up to 129 so here we have a continuous spread of the observations and these blocks they represent the measurement data and again in this graph uh, you can see that the data has become more visual it has become more representative and you can quickly see that what are the uh, trends in this data that where the values are centered so you can see that the values are centered in the middle right so middle observations they have most of the frequencies so our observations they are centered into the middle of this whole range of scores or all of these observations so this is the histogram for a measurement data now we see the concept of frequency polygon and frequency curve and we can make a frequency polygon or a frequency curve onto the histogram and how we can do that if the midpoint of the top of each block in a histogram is joined by a straight line then we are going to have a frequency polygon like in the example that we just saw that we have the length of fish and their frequency is drawn on the y-axis so if we join the midlines of these blocks then we are going to have a straight line and this line represents a, a, a trends in their frequency so it makes the data more representative and you can see that this is a frequency polygon so when we draw this kind of a line onto our histogram to show the trends more explicitly then it is known as a frequency polygon and when we have a continuous variable in which the number of observations are large and the unit increments or the unit steps are small then usually we are going to have a smooth curve so our frequency polygon is going to be a smooth curve and this is known as a frequency curve 
So this is a concept of frequency polygon and frequency curve. So here you have the example of shoot length as we used in the previous um, uh, lecture as well that we were using this example to draw the frequency tables. So here we have the same observations and these are 100 observations and they uh, fall in a spread or in a range of 13, right? So the unit increments, they are 13, so they are small and the number of observations are large. So here, if we make the histogram and if we join the midlines of the histogram, this is going to give us the frequency polygon, but this frequency polygon is perfectly smooth. So this kind of the frequency polygon is usually referred to as a frequency curve. So this is the concept of frequency polygon and frequency curve. It becomes, uh, it, it makes your figures or it makes your histograms more representative. Now we see our next type of the uh, graph, which is a scattergram. And scattergram is also one of the basic types of the graphs that are used in presenting the data. And the scattergram is particularly useful for representing the bivariate data. Now, what is meant by the bivariate data? So bi means two and variate relates to the term variable. So bivariate data is that type of the data when pairs of observations of two variables are obtained from each unit in a sample, right? So example are mass and length of animals. So a bivariate data is when we are going to take the observations for two variables from the same sampling unit. Like we have the or like we have an animal and we are going to measure the length of the animal and from the same animal we are going to take another measurement for another variable which is the mass. So in this case we are taking two observations for two variables from the same sampling unit from the same animal. So this is going to become our bivariate data and um, it is why it is called bivariate because we have taken two observations and these two observations are for two variables, two different variables and therefore this is known as a bivariate data. Now, what we want to do is that we want to represent these two variables on the same plot. We want to represent these two variables on the same graph. So for that purpose, we are going to use the scattergram. We are going to make scattergram for this kind of a bivariate data. And on the scattergram, we have a two-dimensional representation. So two-dimensional representation means that we are going to uh, present both of the variables and one of the variables will be taken along x-axis and the other variable is going to be taken along the y-axis. So what variable should be plotted on along the x-axis and what variable should be plotted along the y-axis? So it depends on the uh, the relationship between the variables, right? So if one of the variables is dependent on the other variable, then we are going to plot the independent variable along the x-axis and the dependent variable along the y-axis. For example, in case of mass and length, we can see that length is independent of weight, right? While weight is somehow dependent on the length of the animal. So the animal, as it, it becomes uh, um, lengthier or it becomes taller, it is going to have more weight, right? So weight is somehow dependent on length when it comes to the relationship between these two variables, right? So weight is not just dependent on the length. There are other factors that contribute to the weight as well, to, to the weight. But in when it comes to these two variables and we want to see their relationship to each other, then we can see that length is something which is not dependent on the weight, while weight is dependent on length. So in case of these types of variables where we can define that which one of the variables is independent of the other and which one of the variables is dependent on the other, then we are going to plot the independent variable along the x-axis and the, in, the dependent variable along the y axis. But if we have the observations which are not uh, related to each other and still we want to draw them on the scattergram, then uh, we can plot any one of them along the x-axis and any one of them along the y-axis, right? 
for example, if you take the measurement of the serum glucose level from a patient and you also take the measurement for their blood pressure and you want to represent these two, uh, both of these uh, variables on a single plot, then you're going to use the scattergram. And in the scattergram, you can plot any one of them along the axis, axis and any one of them along the y-axis because these two, they don't seem to have a relationship between each other that which one is dependent or which one is independent, right? But still, the scattergrams, they are used to find out the relationship, and we, we will see how, right? But if we don't have a pre-information that one variable is dependent on the other or, the, or vice versa, then we can plot any of the variables along any of the axes. So here we are going to take the example of mass and length of the animals and how many uh, sample units do we have? We have 26 sample units and we have measured two observations from each of these 26 sampling units. And these two observations, they relate to two variables. One is length and the other one is mass. Now we are going to make the scattergram for these two variables. And here we have the basic outline, our basic outlay of our scattergram. And you can see that we have x-axis and the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the length of the animal because as we discussed that when it, when it comes to the relationship between length and weight, length is independent of weight while weight is slightly dependent on length. Therefore, we are going to take weight or mass along the y-axis. So uh, here we have our axis defined that which one is x-axis and which one is y-axis. Now let's see the scale on these axes. So here we are not starting from zero. So we are starting from 26 because our lowest observation in length is 28. So we are starting from 26 and our um, lowest observation in the mass is 47. So we are going to start our graph from 45. So this is up to you that from where you want to start your scale. Because if you are going to start from zero, then it is going to become um, less informative, right? And we, we will see a comparison that if we start from zero, then what kind of a graph we are going to have, right? So for now, we start from 26 and uh, 45. So we have the grid lines here and we have the uh, y-axis grid lines. We have the x-axis grid lines and we have the y-axis grid lines. And what these grid lines are for, so these grid lines, as we discussed earlier, this, that these grid lines, they are uh, going to help us in making the scattergram when we are going to make it on paper. We are going to make that manually because it will, uh, these grid lines, they will enable us to scale our observations onto the chart area, right? So starting from the first observation we have, we have uh, 28 and 48. So it means that this is going to the place where we are going to mark our observation. And this place is 28 along the x-axis and 48 along the y-axis. So we are going to point out an, a, a point on the chart area, which corresponds to the x-axis value and its y-axis value. So here we have pointed out that area and we're going to place a dot over here, right? So we are going to place a marker over here, which is going to represent our bivariate observation. And this mark, it relates to 28 value on the x-axis and it relates to 48 value along the y-axis. So here we have placed our first observation in the form of a marker. Then we have our ne next observation, which corresponds to 29 and 49. So again, we are going to mark out the area and we are going to place a marker or a dot or any kind of a marker. You can have a star, you can have a circle, you can have a diamond shaped marker. So you can have any type of a marker. And then you are going to mark all of the observations in your uh, chart. The next observation is 30 and 47. And you can see we have the uh, this marker, this marker represents 30 along the x-axis and this marker represents 47 along the y-axis. And we are uh, going to have all of the observations marked on our scatter gram. So why this is known as the scatter gram? Because it shows the scatter of the observations of two variables in a single graph. So this is a two-dimensional representation, right? So two, why two-dimensional? Because each marker 
right? Each marker on the chart, it is representing two variables at a time, right? So each marker is representing two variables. So therefore, this is known as a two-dimensional representation. Now, after removing the grid lines and uh, removing the uh, chart background color, we are going to have our final figure in this form. So this is the scattergram. And uh, this scattergram is about the uh, two variables, which are length and mass. And you can see that we have properly labeled uh, these uh, variables. The length is along x-axis and the mass is along y-axis. And we also have given the title or the caption of this figure, which is the scattergram of length and mass observations of animals. And uh, you can see the scatter or the spread of the observations over here. So this is the scattergram that we have. Now, this scattergram is about the relationship between length and mass. And we can see that how we can describe this relationship, that what is the purpose of making this scattergram. And here you can clearly see that if uh, we draw a straight line across the scatter of these observations, which is known as the trend line, we can see the trend. And here we can see that what is meant by the relationship between two variables, that what is the purpose of drawing these two variables together? As we discussed, that scattergram is the two-dimensional representation, that it represents two variables at a time. So we have two variables, length and mass, and why we are plotting them on the same plot, why we, on the same plot, why we are making a scattergram, why we are making a two-dimensional picture is because we want to see the relationship between them. And this relationship can be seen by making the trend line. And here you can see that we have a positive trend line. We have a positive straight trend line here, which means that with increasing length, we have increase in mass as well. So this is how you can see the relationship between two, these two variables, that we can see a common trend that as the length of the animal is increasing, the mass of animal is also increasing. So this is what is meant by a scattergram and why this scattergram is used. So scattergram is used to represent two variables, a bivariate data when two variables are taken from each sampling unit in the population. And what kind of the scatter, uh, or what kind of uh, representation this one is. So this is a two dimensional representation in which we are representing two variables, right? And why this is known as two dimensional? Because we are presenting two variables and each marker on the plot, right? Each dot or each marker on the plot that belongs to two variables that represents two observations at a time. That is why this is two dimensional, right? And the other thing that uh, the uh, why we use the scattergrams is that because we are plotting the two variables and we want to see their relationship, right? So because it is going to give us the relationship between these two variables, therefore we are going to make the scattergram. So this is the purpose of making scattergram that we have two variables and we want to see the trends that if we increase one variable, that the if we increase the um, a variable which is plotted along the x-axis, then we can see that what is the effect on the variable on the y-axis. And here you can see that the observations are scattered in such a way that as we increase the length, we are also seeing an increase in the mass. So this is what scattergrams are used for. And here uh, we can quickly see the the choice of our scales, the choice of the units on our scale that from where we want to start our scale. And here you can see that we have the scale that starts from 26 and 45, our customized values. And here is the scale um, that starts from zero. So you can clearly see the difference in their presentation that which one of these uh, figures is more informative and which one is less informative. So this is the purpose of uh, customizing your uh, starting points on the scale that you want to make your data more representative. Now we are going to discuss the pi or the circle graph and the pi or circle graph is also one of the basic types of the graphs that are mostly used in biological research. And this type of the graph is suitable for the data which consists of percentages or proportions of different activities or different categories. And we are going to take the example of, um, we are going to actually take two examples. And these examples are from the uh, goat species, the nannies and billies, the nanny goats and the billy goats. 
And what is um, documented in this example is that their percentage of time spent on different activities, which means that it is their time budget analysis. The percentage of their time in a day that they spend on different activities, right? So this is the observation that we have. And here in the table, you can see that their activities have been mentioned. Different categories of their activities have been mentioned. They are feeding, lying, standing, walking, and their social activities. And the percentage of time which is spent in each of these activities is also shown against both of the species. So we have uh, nannies which spend their 67% of the time in feeding, and we have billies which spend their 34% of the time in feeding. And we can have the uh, we can see the percentages of all these activities by the two goat species. Now we want to see in the form of the graph that uh, which activity takes most of their time. So here we have the activity budget graph for nannies, and in this you can see that the different activities have been presented by different colors. Like the feeding is presented by the blue color, lying is presented by the red shade, the standing is presented by a green shade, walking is presented by a purple shade, and social is uh, represented by an azure shade, right? So we have different colors and shades that represent different activities. And in this uh, figure, you can quickly see that most of their time is spent in feeding, right? So they spend most of their time in feeding, and they also spend most uh, a major proportion of their time lying. And they spend least of their time in walking and in social activities. So here you can quickly see the percentage of time spent in different activities. And now you can compare that with the table, that although in the table you also have mentioned their values, their percentage time spent, but which one is more visual, which one is more informative, you can clearly see that the graph is more informative. So graph gives you a quick look of the activities performed by these goats. Then we have the graph for our second goat species, which are the billies, and you can see that their time budget is also presented in the form of a graph and these activities are presented by different colors. And in this case, you can see that they spend most of their time lying. So they are quite lazy. Um, we can say that they're quite lazy type of the billies. So they are, are, and they spend less of their time in feeding. And here again, you can see that in comparison to the values, the graphs are more informative and they quickly give you an idea that uh, how they spend their day, that what is the percentage of different activities. And similarly, if we have uh, different species and we want to see that uh, what is the percentage of each species, then we can present their uh, percentages in the form of a pie graph or in the form of a circle graph, and that will become more informative. And we can present any kind of the percentages or proportions and we can present them in the form of a circle and that makes the data more informative and more visual. So this is the purpose of using the pie or the circle graphs. Now here today we have discussed different types of the uh, graphs, different types of the basic graphs that are used in biological research.